Okay, so let's get started. So remember that you have a quiz on Wednesday. And one of the things that it is going to be over is the integumentary system. And so you're going to probably most likely see this diagram of the skin. And so you need to be able to layer the different um, parts of it. So remember that we talked about the difference between the epidermis and the dermis. And the epidermis, remember, is epithelial tissue, whereas the dermis is connective tissue. And you can see that the dermis is what is vascularized. So the blood vessels extend into the dermis and um, provide nutrients to the epidermis. The basal layer of the dermis is, or excuse me, of the epidermis is where we have um, stem cells, cells that undergo mitosis to replace the other cells in the epidermis. And so the cells start here and then they migrate to the surface. And by the time we get to the outer surface, it is just a layer of dead cells. And what type of protein do those cells have in them? Keratin. So keratin is a structural protein that provides kind of the strength of the skin. Remember that the hair is also consists of keratin. So here we see the hair bulb. Notice that the hair is vascularized. And down here, we have a part of the hair follicle called the hair matrix which actually produces the cells that make up the hair. And the hair is also, or consists of keratinized dead cells, okay? So um, also notice that there are sebaceous glands that produce sebum that help to lubricate the skin and lubricate the hairs. And then we have eccrine glands like this one, which is also called a sweat gland, which produces sweat on the surface of the body and helps in thermoregulation. You notice that all the yellow structures in here are actually nerve, nerve, nervous system. And so we have modified um, sensory receptors that allow us to feel touch. So deep in the dermis, this would be deep touch. But also at the surface of the skin, we have, we have touch receptors and pain receptors that give us some information about what is happening um, with the surface of our skin. And it's kind of interesting because most of that information that we get from the surface of the skin never actually makes it to your conscious part of your brain. So think of you are consciously aware of all the sensations of like the clothes touching your body. It would probably drive you crazy. And in fact, people that have um, some forms of autism, that is a problem is that they have to wear certain clothes that don't, don't bother them because they get overstimulated really easily. So we have sensory receptors all over the surface of the skin. And then we just kind of get used to that sensation or aren't consciously aware of it, okay? Are there any other questions about the structure of the skin? Remember that it is an organ because it is composed of many different types of tissues. Okay, so we are moving on to the next chapter and I think that this is chapter six in your book. So we're gonna start talking about the skeletal system. And the first thing we're gonna talk about are the cartilages. So do cartilages have um, a blood supply in them? No, right? So they are not vascular. Okay. So that means that any nutrients that the cells in the cartilage get actually has to move through diffusion through and into the matrix. And we actually did a lab on this when we were creating those artificial cells and we saw how the vinegar diffused, that would be exactly the same thing. So if that was a piece of cartilage, the diffusion of nutrients and oxygen would just simply occur across the surface. And they also have to get rid of waste that way too. So waste products have to diffuse in the other way. So remember that diffusion is just a, um, uh, movement of substances from a higher concentration to a lower concentration, and it doesn't take um, um, uh, doesn't take energy, right? So it doesn't actually take life because it'll actually occur in a lawn living system as well. So they're not vascular; they have no nervous supply. Oops, nervous. So what we call this is innervation. 
So when we talk about a tissue being innervated, that means that nervous tissue comes into there and can release neurotransmitters and cause a response. So these have no innervation. They also are mainly composed of water. So remember that we talked about the matrix and how there are substances in the ground substance of the matrix, which are called proteoglycans. And proteoglycans attract and trap water. And so this is, in order for cartilage to be healthy, it has to have lots of water, right? And so this is actually one reason why you wanna drink lots of water, is to keep your skeletal cartilages from dying, drying out, right? So as you get older, your cartilages start to dry out. And I actually have cartilage in my back, the intervertebral disc that dried out so much that when they went in, they did a surgery and they went in and tried to um, repair the herniation of my disc. They said that it was so dehydrated that it actually just crumbled like, like old foam, right? So it was just like falling apart. And they weren't prepared for that to happen. And so they actually, the doctor said that they just simply stuffed the pieces back in to my spine and then quickly sewed me up, right? And so that is what happens when your cartilage starts to dry out, right? So it's very bad. You need to drink lots of water. Okay. So when we look at the um, skeletal cartilage, we have different types. So we have hyaline, and this is the most abundant. And we looked at this underneath our... Um, microscope, and we saw that there are chondrocytes that sit in sp spaces called lacunae, right? So if you reviewed your, or we, actually I have your lab notebook, but if you reviewed that lab, it would talk about those. Um, the hyaline cartilage is glassy. And so where it is located generally tells me um, what type of hyaline cartilage it is. So for example, we could talk about articular cartilage. So where do you think articular cartilage would be found? Does anybody know? Your ears. Hmm? Like your ears. Oh, that's a good question. That's a good, but or is A-U-R. So it'd be orticular. <laughs> so that's not in the ear. That's actually elastic cartilage. Maybe your joints? Yes, your joints. So when we talk about articulations, that is where two bones come together. So remember, we already talked about the articulation of the lower mandible with your temporal bone. And so this is in joints. So this is at the ends of bones. Okay. So um, if you eat a chicken bone and you're eating it, that's the, the real glassy you know, stuff at the end of the bone. Right, and it's soft, right? And it, it feels like, you know, you could chew on it a little bit, so it's like gristle, okay? So that's the articular cartilage. We also have um, the um, cartilage called the um, nasal cartilages. So that would be obviously in the outer nose, right? So we have the nasal bone, which is located up here, but all of this, the external nose, the external nose, is nasal cartilages. So that is hyaline cartilage. Okay. We also have the respiratory cartilages. And where do you think the respiratory cartilages are located? What organ? What do we feel right here? Your trachea, right? So the trachea is supported by hyaline cartilage rings. Okay. And then we have what is called the costal cartilages. And does anybody know what costal, what that root word means? This is actually your ribs. So we kind of looked at the rib cage um, last week in lab, and where your ribs articulate with your sternum um, is actually composed of hyaline cartilage. So that makes your rib cage kind of bouncy. So like if you were to do um, chest compressions on a person during CPR, you would feel that, the, that it 
kind of bounces so that you're not going to break, well, you could break the bone, but you, generally it would just move up and down, the sternum does. So it gives the rib cage a little bit more flexibility than if it was completely covered in bone, right, or completely attached by bone. Okay, so those are the hyaline cartilages. So in your book, they have a diagram, and hyaline is always drawn as blue. So the hyaline cartilages are always blue in color. You can see that there is another type of cartilage, which is called elastic cartilage. And there are actually only two places that we have elastic cartilage in our body. And that is in the outer ear and in what we call the epiglottis. So the epiglottis is inside your um, pharynx. And where your pharynx, which is the back of your throat, connects with your trachea up here, um, you can see that there is a flap. And so the epiglottis actually folds down and it prevents food from going into your respiratory system. So it is a valve that prevents food from going into the respiration so that it goes into your esophagus, which is actually part of your digestive system. Okay. You also see that there's a little bone here, right? And that bone, we'll talk about, that is the hyoid bone. Um, that is a really interesting bone because it is not connected to any other bones. It just kind of floats here. It's connected to the cartilage that makes up the Adam's apple in males or makes up your larynx, your voice box. But then it also kind of connects um, to uh, ligaments or yeah, ligaments that connect it to the, um, uh, the styloid process. Okay. The other type of cartilage, which is in red, is called fibrocartilage. And where do you think fibrocartilage is found? This was, didn't you have homework on this last night over the skeletal cartilages? What? Pubic symphysis? And also in between the vertebrae, so this is the intervertebral discs. So those are the two places we have fibrocartilage in our bodies. We also, I forgot to mention, there also is between the knee. So we have the menisci between the knee, the meniscus in knee and let's see if they have one in your tmj joint because usually they don't have that one listed but there's also another little cartilage pad that will um, i'll show you a video of it when people open their jaw this cartilage pad actually has to move so that you unhinge your jaw in order to completely open it up okay so that's fibrocartilage Okay, so we saw this in the histology of this in lab. So you should be able to identify um, the image of the um, hyaline cartilage. Notice that there are no fibers. You cannot see the fibers in the hyaline cartilage. But in the elastic cartilage, oops, there should be a picture of that. The elastic cartilage, the um, fibers are readily observable. And then we can see that there's lots of fiber, fibers in the um, fibrocartilage. But you'll notice that the collagen and the, and the fibers kind of run in different, uh, they're kind of more, they're not as, um, they're not like dense regular connective tissue. So they're more um, just interwoven. Um, so that's a picture of the fibrocartilage. Okay. So if you look at the handout that I gave you, we're gonna just go over some bone histology. This should be kind of a review because we actually already looked at bone in lab. So you should be able to help me with this. So this central canal right here, this actually has another word which is called the haversion canal. So the haversion canal is the central canal. And you could write down there that it has blood vessels. 
and it also has nerve supply. So when we look at the bone histology, we say that bone is vascularized and it is innervated. So nervous tissue goes into the bone to stimulate it. Okay. So in the bone itself, we have uh, mature cells. And what are the mature cells called in bone? Osteocytes. So osteo means bone. If we were talking about cells that were giving rise to osteocytes, we would call them osteoblasts. And if we were talking about cells that were eating away at the bone, they would be osteoclasts. Excellent. Okay. So these osteocytes are in spaces called lacunae. So the lacunae is the space in which the cell sits because the cell cannot be in the matrix itself. It has to be surrounded by water. And then it also has cytoplasmic extensions. So those cytoplasmic extensions, you can kind of see um, here. So the cell would have these extensions out into the matrix and those are called canaliculi. So an, and have, so I'll put a comma here, have canal iculi. So these are cytoplasmic extensions. Now, one thing that is not labeled here is that circular um, structure that we see. So I could kind of draw this. So this whole circular structure is sometimes referred to as a haversion system, but we're gonna call it an osteon. So an osteon would be just one of those circles. And then within the osteon, you'll notice that we have rings. And so that is what is labeled here. And does anybody remember what those rings are called? It does start with an L. So it's called lamellae. So sometimes they call this lamellar, lamel, lamellar, sorry, lamellar bone. This is also compact bone. So those rings actually have to do with the direction of the, um, of the collagen fibers. And so if we looked at not a cross section through the compact bone, but if we looked at a diagram showing the, um, uh, um, oops, we looked at the diagram, it would look like this, this one. So if we looked at the diagram of, um, this is on the back of your sheet of paper, this shows the lamellae, so this would be a lamellae, right? And these white structures right here are the collagen fibers. So the way that they run in different directions means that the bone becomes stronger and it resists twisting. So it resists torsion, okay? So resists twisting motion. Twisting mo motion is also called torsion. Okay. If we go back to our diagram, this right here is a cross section through the bone. So I'll put cross section through bone, right? And what we see here is, is that where the bone is highly um, mineralized, it is said to be compact bone. So this right here would be the compact bone. So it is really hard, it's very mineralized. And inside the compact bone, we see that the bone is not solid all the way through. Beyond the compact bone, we have what is called the spongy bone. 
So this is my spongy bone. And the reason for this is, is that this makes your skeleton much lighter than it normally would be. If your bones were solid, they would be much heavier, right? And so it'd be harder to move. And in fact, if you look at um, birds or rabbits are kind of notorious for this, but bird bones is, is that they have, few, they have less compact bone and more spongy bone. So their skeletons are much lighter than our skeletons, which gives them the problem that their bones tend to break. And so they, their bones are a little bit more fragile than ours. So there's a balance be, between our bones being heavy and strong and then them being fragile and being able to break. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about how the forces on your body can actually determine how much compact bone you have. So for example, if you are a, a um, an athlete and you bat or you maybe if you're a tennis player and you use you serve with one arm the side that has more stresses upon it is actually going to grow thicker so your body your bones respond to pressure exerted on them by changing their structure okay so in that spongy bone you'll notice that there are little um, kind of bridges or little like beams and those have a specific name. And so this is called trabeculae. So the trabeculae, I guess that technically means little beams. So the spongy bone has trabeculae and the um, compact bone does not. So that actually helps to strengthen it as well. So it's kind of like a steel girder system in a in a um, in a uh, building. Okay. Now you notice that the outside of the bone is not bone per se, but it is actually connective tissue. Um, actually, a type of connective tissue called a periosteum. Okay. So this is. Um, connective tissue it's not cartilage because here you can see that it's vascularized and it has um, a nervous supply to it. it has that yellow thing in it so that's a nerve that innervates it but the periosteum actually allows the bone to have something to attach it to so if you think about like how does your muscle attach to compact bone it doesn't your muscle, the tendon, actually attaches to the periosteum, and the periosteum is then attached to the bone. So the outer bone has a layer of um, dense, regular connective tissue around it. Okay, that would be connective tissue proper, would be the true connective tissue, not the cartilage. Okay, so I'll put connective tissue proper. Okay. So it's important to realize that your bones are not just bone tissue, but your bones are also organs. And um, the bones also um, have, are living, right? So your bones are not dead, they're actually alive. Okay, so let's talk about the function of the bones. So obviously one function would be protection. So if we look at the skull, or the vertebrae, these surround the nervous system and help to protect it. Your spinal cord runs right down the middle of the vertebral foramen, the hole in the vertebrae. We also have the rib cage, and the rib cage protects the lungs and the heart. We also have a function of support. So if you think about it, um, that it can be different than movement. So if I'm just standing upright and I'm not moving, what is keeping me upright is my bones, right? So I'm able to support my body weight against gravity, okay? So support body against gravity. So everything kind of lines up as I bring my pelvis, my chest, and my head all into alignment. Your femurs are your biggest bones because they're what 
uh, supports the majority of your body weight. Okay, we also have a mineral storage. So do you remember what two minerals are found in the bone matrix? Calcium and phosphate. We also have fat storage. So interestingly, the middle of our bones, the middle of our long bones, for example, the middle of my humerus, my middle of my radius and my ulna, if you broke those open in the mineral, I would have fat. And so the fat storage is in the shaft of long bones. So those are triglycerides. But in babies, a lot of those um, areas that in, in me store fat are actually red bone marrow. So we have blood production. Right, so this is um, the bone marrow. I have a question about that. Um, yep. Yesterday when I was doing the homework, it was asking us a question about yellow bone marrow. This is yellow bone marrow, yeah, okay. sorry. This is yellow. Okay. Why is it yellow? Does anybody remember what? Adipose tissue. Adipose tissue, but why is the adipose tissue yellow? Protein in it. So beta carotene is a pigment that we, um, a nutrient that we get from eating vegetables. I was telling my daughters about this because they don't like to eat their vegetables, right? But like um, sweet potato fries, right? They have beta carotene in them. And so this is actually important antioxidant. So we tend to store it with our fat because when we break down the fat, we produce oxidants and then that actually helps to neutralize those oxidants and kind of prevent them from doing damage to our body. So most of our fat is yellow. So even underneath so the subcutaneous fat, you'll notice that it is yellow because of that um, beta carotene that we store. Okay. Beta carotene, I also mentioned, if you eat it in excessive, it can make your skin turn yellow. Okay, okay so that's the bone marrow. This is the red bone marrow. And we'll talk more about that. Okay, the other thing that they just recently discovered, which is a function of the, um, the bone, is, is the fact that our bone produces hormones. And the hormone is called osteocalcin. And it doesn't regulate calcium levels. Interestingly, osteocalcin is a hormone produced by our bones that regulates glucose homeostasis, which is big, right? Because one of the big problems that we have these days is with diabetes, right? Diabetes is running rampant. And so um, maybe this can play a role because this helps to regulate the production of insulin. So um, if you become insulin resistant, then you become um, type two diabetic, which can lead to all kinds of other health problems. So this is new, um, just recently they discovered that the skeleton also produces hormones. I think I mentioned that fat sometimes, also, fat does produce hormones, that was also another recent discovery. So fat produces hormones as well. So not just endocrine glands produce hormones, but we're finding that where we look in other places, they also produce hormones. And then we have, I should put this baby up there with support and protection, but we have movement. Okay, so this is where we have joints. So movement occurs at joints. So one of the things that we'll talk about when we get to muscles is that, that the muscles have to extend across the joints and muscles only pull. So my biceps muscle has to actually extend across my elbow joint because it's pulling my lower arm towards my upper arm. And so that is a form of movement, right? That we'll talk about joints. This is, this is um, what is referred to as flexion. And then extending my arm is called extension. 
Okay, so let's look at the structure of the bone, and you have a diagram that shows this. We have um, the main shaft, and the main shaft is called di the diaphysis. Okay, so this is the main shaft. So here we're focusing on long bones. We'll actually look at different types of bones. Um, um, some of our bones are irregularly shaped, like our vertebrae. So the vertebrae have all kinds of stuff going on, holes and you know, processes coming out. So this is specifically um, in long bones. So the diaphysis, we have the main shaft. The ends of the bones are called the epiphyses. And there's two of them. So this is the ends of the bones. Now the one, if we're talking about our arm, the one that is closest to the center of the body where it would connect it to the body is called the proximal. So we have the proximal epiphysis versus distal epiphysis. So that's epiphyses in plural, okay. So let's look at it, the diagram that I gave you. Oops. Okay, so this is the diagram right here. So this, what bone do you think this is? Just by looking at it. Not the femur. It is the humerus, so it is the upper arm bone. Okay, so this would be the proximal epiphysis. This whole structure right here would be the diaphysis. The center of the bone is hollow um, and it is generally filled with fat. So you can see that that would be the yellow bone marrow. This is called the medullary cavity. And so this would be the yellow bone marrow. So the lining on the outside of the bone is called what again? Periosteum. Now the innermost, there's also another membrane that lines the inside of the bone. And so I'm just gonna put it right on here. So the inside lining the medullary cavity is also connective tissue proper, which is called the end osteum. So it's not only lined by connective tissue on the outside, but also on the inside. And notice that there is a nutrient channel that is coming through and piercing the periosteum to get inside the bone. So this would be my nutrient channel. Oops, nutrient channel. So that is a blood vessel, right? That is carrying oxygen and nutrients into the bone. So it doesn't just go into the bone in multiple places. There's usually just one place at this in the middle that carries the nutrients into the bone. Okay. So at the very end, this would be the um, part of the humerus that articulates with your radius and your ulna. And so this is what is called the distal epiphysis. Now, if we go back to the proximal epiphyses, notice that we can see the difference between compact bone and spongy bone. So I'm gonna put right here, I'm gonna put, this is my spongy bone. But notice that there is a line here. This is in an adult bone. So we're, this is different than when we're talking about uh, fetuses or when we're talking about babies or children. But in us, if we have stopped growing, this is what is referred to as the epiphyseal plate. 
oh, sorry, epiphyseal line. So it used to be a plate of hyaline cartilage. So if we are still growing, we have the epiphyseal plate. So we have what is called the growth plate. And the growth plate is cartilage that can undergo cell division and push, and it can cause the bone to lengthen. Right? The ends of the bones will get longer. So that's how we go from little kids to big grown-ups, right? Is that hyaline cartilage that remains at the ends of the bones. And that would also be at the other side of the bone as well. In the distal epiphyses, they just didn't show that there. Okay. So what is this blue? stuff right here. What type of tissue? Connective tissue, but what type? It's blue. It's at the end of the bones where the bones articulate. Hyaline, right? So this is articular cartilage. And it is hyaline. So if we look at the other structure that is on your, oops, diagram. Did I not put it on here? Oh, I didn't put it on here. So if we look at the other structure, it is just this enlarged, right? So in the back, it's that enlarged. So the other thing that I wanted to just point out is, is that there is a connection of collagen fibers that connect the periosteum to the actual bone. And these are what are called Sharpie's fibers. <laughs> So these are collagen fibers that connect the periosteum to the bone. So let's go back and talk about the other types of bones. Okay. So we'll put types of bones here. Okay. So we just talked about a long bone. And long bones are any bones where the length is greater than the width. So if you think about it, even the bones in our fingers, our phalanges, would be, they'd be longer than they are wide. Our um, metacarpals, which are located in the palm of our hand, would still be longer than they are wide. But what about our wrist bones? The wrist bones are not. And so the wrist bones are what we call short bones. So these are cube-shaped. So this would include our carpals. So that is wrist. So if these are our carpals, what are the bones that are in our ankle? Tarsals. Tarsals. Okay. So those are considered to be short bones. So the tarsals, which include like the talus and the cuboid bones, would all be cube-shaped or short bones. Okay. And then we have what are called irregular bones. Which kind of don't fit any kind of classification. But irregular would include things like your vertebrae. And your coxal bone, which is where? Your, that's coccyx. So if I put my hands on my hips, that's my coxal bone. And so we actually have two coxal bones that come together to make up our bony pelvis. And so our coxal bone is very weirdly shaped, right? It's got the pubic symphysis, 
And then it's got our tail where we sit, um, our sits bones, it's not our tailbone, that's actually connected to the sacrum. But that would be some examples of irregular bones. Okay. And then we have flat bones. Okay. So flat bones would include things like our skull and our sternum and our scapula. And so flat bones are different in their structure than long bones in that they have com or spongy bone um, separated by two layers of compact bone. So here's my compact bone, right? And then I have spongy bone in the middle. I'm gonna draw it kind of like this. Okay, there's lots of spaces, right? So this is my spongy bone. between the two layers of the compact bone. And it has a specific name for it. So instead of calling it trabeculae, they call the spongy bone diploe. So the spongy bone in flat bones has a term called diploe, and that just describes the spongy bone and the spaces in the spongy bone that exist that are between the two compact pieces. So even bones like your parietal bone, like if you cut through it, in the middle of it would be the diploe. Okay. So if we look at a diagram, an image of this, okay. So this is my parietal bone. This is the compact bone. And then in the middle, we have the spongy bone. Okay. The diploe. Okay, so we talked about the structure of the long bone. Okay, so when we talk about the red bone marrow, this has a term which is called hematopoietic. So think of like um, hemoglobin, and then poiesis means to produce. And so this is blood producing tissue or red bone marrow. So there are stem cells that reside in here. And the stem cells um, are found in the loose connective tissue called reticular connective tissue. So these stem cells undergo cell division and then they divide and they produce both erythrocytes and leukocytes. They also produce um, the um, platelets that allow your blood to clot, right? So they produce all the mature cells that we talked about that are found in blood. Now, if we look at where the hematopoietic tissue exists, in babies, it's all over the place. So if we were looking at like just the femur, so if we're looking at an infant, Notice that the red bone marrow fills up their whole center of their femur. And then as they start to get older, that red bone marrow becomes smaller and smaller, and it is replaced with yellow bone marrow. And then in the adult, there are only a few places. One would be the hip bone, so the coxal bone, but also the head of the femur would be um, where it is found. Now, really interestingly, if you lose a lot of blood and you need to produce more blood, then some of that yellow bone marrow can be reconverted into red bone marrow. So for some things that um, cause um, diseases, like um, diseases where your body can't produce white blood cells, then you can take the bone marrow from one person and put it into another person so you can extract the bone marrow put it into another person's bone, and that will seed that bone with stem cells that then will produce normal white blood cells that might be able to replace the defective white blood cells or the other cells in the body that blood that need to be produced. So that's the hematopoietic tissue. 
Okay. So if we look at the composition of bone, we have in the matrix, we have organic composition. We have organic molecules and primarily that is collagen. So collagen is what makes your bone white. And so if you think about like finding bones, you know, in the environment, they are white and they are hard. This is actually not hard. Okay. But it is still pretty tough. So what you can do, which is kind of an interesting experiment, um, is you can take a chicken bone and you can put it in vinegar and you can put it into your fridge and then every couple of days change out the vinegar. And after a couple of weeks, you'll have a bone and all you will have is the collagen. And so what you'll find is, is you can take your chicken bone and you can bend it in half and then it'll spring back, right? And it's like rubbery, right? So this is more rubbery. So you can completely take out the minerals, minerals. so you can demineralize the bone. We also have the um, inorganic. So these are the minerals. And primarily, these are calcium phosphate salts. And this is what makes the bones hard. So occasionally, when we look at diseases, it could be that the bone is not properly mineralized. So the bones are too soft. And so there is a term for this, which is called osteomalacia. So this means literally means kind of soft bones. And we actually talked about this already because we were talking about the role of vitamin D and if you don't have vitamin D, then you can't absorb calcium. And so this means that they are insufficiently mineralized. Oops, mineralization. And so this can lead to rickets in children. So rickets is generally due to a vitamin D deficiency. And so if we look at a picture of what happens if your bones are too soft while you're specifically growing, then you can see this is the normal anatomy. This is the rickets. And so their bones can break, but they tend to just get bowed. So this is a child with rickets. And so the bones are too soft. Okay, this is different than what is called osteoporosis. And so in osteoporosis, we also have insufficient mineralization and it actually makes the bones brittle. Okay, so also um, makes bones brittle. See if I want what I want to say about that. Sorry. Okay. So this is actually where bone reabsorption. So remember, we talked about how bones are kind of always being rebuilt. So bone reabsorption outpaces bone deposition. So there is less matrix. Okay, so this makes the bones um, more likely to break. Now osteoporosis tends to be a problem in um, females, specifically for some reason, white uh, females that are of middle age um, or older. So um, older females that are white, they tend to have more of a problem with osteoporosis. Okay. So specifically postmenopausal. 
So what do they do? What do they, if you knew somebody who they thought their bones were getting brittle, but they just wanted to make sure, what would they go in and do? Anybody know? They would do a bone scan, right? So a bone scan looks at the density of the bone. So it looks at the density of the matrix. And they say, ah, oh, you have um, weak bones. So what do they sometimes do? There's two things that they would do for a female. What would they prescribe? Um, yes. But also remember that calcium cannot be reabsorbed or absorbed from the digestive tract without vitamin D. So I'll put vitamin D here. But if you drink milk, they have added vitamin D to it. So you might also want to take vitamin D. So if you take a calcium pill, you might want to take your vitamin D with it. What else? So they say, oh, you need to go lift weights, right? So if you think about the rack and you go in there, there's a whole section where older people are lifting weights and you're like, what are they trying to do? Are they trying to look good, right? Are they like trying to beef up, all right? No, their doctor told them that they needed to go lift weights, right? You could also do other exercises. So you can do push-ups, right? You don't have to use the machines or lift the weights, right? But so you can do weight-bearing exercises because that is going to increase the density of their matrix because hopefully their bones will respond, okay? The other thing that they have been doing, but there has grown kind of controversial, is they give you hormone replacement therapy. So obviously females that are postmenopausal are gonna have less estrogen, and less estrogen is linked with osteoporosis. And so then they decided that they were just going to give women hormone replacement therapy. But the problem is, is that this has now been linked with reproductive cancers. So um, there is a controversy over now whether or not people with osteoporosis should be prescribed those, um, because there is a big downside to that, is that might lead to, for, for example, uterine cancer or, or uh, breast cancer if they take hormone replacements. So that's osteoporosis. Okay. So this is a, um, showing an electron microscope picture. This is normal bone. And so these would be the trabeculae, right? And so the trabeculae, the, the material in the matrix becomes less dense. It becomes more porous, hence the porotic. So think porous bones. And so it is much more likely to break. So there's actually this really interesting theory about um, older people um, breaking bones. And so sometimes you hear, you hear this a lot, like I was just walking along and I fell down and I broke my hip, right? There's this new, actually new theory that states that their, their hip bone was so weak that they actually put weight on it, it broke and then they fell down. So they actually broke their hip and then as a byproduct they fell down. Right? So what caused the broken hip? It could have been just the simple placing of weight on the leg caused the broken hip. It wasn't the fall. So people are always talking about how can I increase my balance so that I have less likely chance of a fall, so I'm not going to break a bone, end up in the hospital, get some kind of infection, and then die, right? Okay. It's dangerous, right, to go into the hospital. Okay. So when they talk about the fracture of a hip, you cannot break a joint. And so typically the fracture of a hip occurs in the femur. So this is the head of the femur. This is called the neck um, of the femur. And so it occurs right there. So when they talk about breaking a hip, that's what they're talking about. They're not actually talking about the hip bone. They're talking about where the femur articulates with the pelvis. Okay, 
So let's talk about bone development. Now there is two ways that our bones develop, but the primary way is what is referred to as endochondral ossification. Okay, so if we look at these words, endro means inside, chondral means cartilage. And so this is this idea that as we first develop inside our mother's womb, our bones are actually composed of hyaline cartilage. So fetal bones are composed of hyaline cartilage. And we'll call them models, right? So even your humerus is not bone yet. It is just made of hyaline cartilage. And then what happens is, is these cartilage cells develop and they start producing a matrix and they turn into bone. So ossification is the process of mineralizing the cartilage. Cartilage cells will then die and they'll be replaced with bone. Cartilage does not have a blood supply. So if it finds itself in the mineral, in, in, a, in a hardened matrix, it can't get nutrients because the nutrients cannot diffuse across, right? So the cartilage cells die and are replaced with bone. Okay, so this is majority of our bones develop in this way. It's kind of interesting because if you think about sharks, they do not mineralize their bones. So they have bones, but their bones are just composed of hyaline cartilage. And it's really interesting because they believe that the ancestors to the sharks were actually bony fish. And so the, the sharks evolved from a fish that had bones, and then essentially they just started using their hyaline cartilage that they had during development, and they never mineralized the bones. So um, cartilaginous fish are don't have generally have much, but or don't have bone inside of them. Okay, the second one is called intramembranous. Ossification. And so instead of being inside the cartilage, like endochondral means, this is inside a membrane. So we have a fibrous membrane that is then replaced with bone. These are our flat bones. So the bones of your skull are formed from a fibrous membrane. And that fibrous membrane can still be found in babies. And sometimes that is called their soft spots, right? The soft spot. On top of baby's head. Oops, head. Is that membrane and it is called the fontanelle and so those soft spots are places where the the, the bones are going to continue to enlarge so the head of the baby um, has to get bigger right also those bones actually have to be easily compressed and kind of movable so they need to still be movable so that when they come out, sometimes the baby has a very weird shaped head, right? And that's because there's membranes between those bones. And sometimes they have like a cone head and their bones are still soft. And you're like, oh my God, my baby's got this cone head, right? And then eventually it'll just go back to normal. Sometimes babies have problems with um, getting that to, that to fuse. And so sometimes you'll see babies with helmets on. And that could be a problem because their bones 
like they're older babies, you know, like they're two and they have a helmet on. It's because for some reason their um, their uh, flat bones are not fusing back together again, and that becomes a problem because they could easily get damage to the brain. Okay, so that's in intramembranous. So this is an example of the intramembranous. So this would be inside the membrane right here. These are the cells, the osteoblasts, that are going to start to lay down the matrix. Right? And so they lay down the matrix, and they create um, uh, the flat bones that we see. So this is actually an example of intramembranous. Okay? This is different than the endochondral, which looks like this. So we start out with kind of producing a bony, um, uh, some bone that is located around the diaphysis, the shaft. And then those cartilage cells start to die because they're not getting nutrients across their surface, right? And so that is what creates the medullary cavity. And then we get some blood vessels coming in and laying down and providing nutrients. Then we get the formation of that articular cartilage, right? So the articular cartilage is just left over hyaline cartilage from when we, our bones developed in uterus. So this would be like what is happening inside during embryonic development. And then we get a second nutrient supply to each of the epiphyses. And then you'll notice that the hyaline cartilage that is left over, what is this referred to as? It's not the line, it's the plate. Okay, so this is your growth plate. So that's the epiphyseal plate. That is your growth plate that is going to allow the bones to lengthen. Okay, I think I'm going to stop there for today. And then um, we'll finish this chapter, chapter six, on um, Wednesday. So remember to study for your quiz, which is over everything since the last quiz. And I'll hand your last quiz back on Wednesday as well.